Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Allie Bell, and I am the Education Director for Canopy. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome you to today's webinar. Canopy is an urban forestry nonprofit. We plant and care for trees throughout the Mid Peninsula. Um, and we offer webinars to provide guidance from Bay Area experts on ways to grow and preserve our urban forests by providing useful tools and information to decision makers like you. So thank you so much for taking the time and having the interest to be here today. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners at the County of Santa Clara Office of Sustainability for making today's webinar possible. The focus of today's webinar is creating and sustaining denser, greener cities. This topic was inspired by an article that was published in January 2023 in People and Nature. Um, and that article was focused on green interventions in high density urban areas. The article really resonated with us at Canopy and with our mission. And so we're thrilled to have an excellent panel of experts on that topic today including one of the co-authors of the article. They're here to inspire us to consider how this concept might apply to our own work and communities and to equip us with the practical tools needed to make change happen. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Um, first, I imagine that you'll have many uh, questions for our speakers today. Um, the Q&A tool is available for you to share those questions with the speakers. And then we will have a moderator at the end of the webinar um, who will share some of those questions and invite the speakers to answer them aloud. Um, so the speakers will be focusing on sharing their presentations during the webinar, so they won't be pausing to answer questions at that moment but we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, some questions uh, given you know, time constraints may not be answered today. So if that is the case, we will compile the unanswered questions. We'll ask our panelists to help us respond to them. And we will make sure that those are um, added to the Canopy website as soon as possible after the webinar. Um, I do want to make sure that everyone in attendance knows that today's webinar is recorded um, and it will be uploaded to our website along with the presentation slides and links to relevant resources during the webinar. At the end of the webinar today, you will be prompted to fill out a survey. We'll put it in the chat at the end and you'll also receive um, kind of a pop-up link when you leave the Zoom session um, and we'd be really grateful for your feedback. If you are an ISA certified arborist and you're participating in this webinar, please do fill out the survey as that will allow you to receive um, the, your uh, CEU code once you have submitted the survey. All right, and with that, I am so thrilled to introduce our speakers today. We will have three panelists with us, Dr. Erica Spotswood, Paul Kephart, and Allison Hicks. And I'm going to each introduce each of them um, more thoroughly as they begin their presentation. So our first speaker today is Dr. Erica Spotswood. Um, she is the Director of Science and Senior Ecologist with Second Nature. Erica is an urban ecologist with nearly a decade of experience working with scientists, designers, and conservation practitioners to analyze and improve nature in our cities. She specializes in using science to guide urban biodiversity conservation, evaluating biodiversity responses to changes in the urban landscape, and making connections between urban biodiversity and human health and well being. Erica has led projects in partnership with cities, park districts, conservation nonprofits, urban designers, and private companies. She brings broad experience creating effective cross-disciplinary collaborations to guide nature interventions in urban settings. Prior to joining Second Nature, Erica was the science director for the Urban Nature Lab at the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Erica serves on the advisory council for Canopy and holds a PhD from the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California at Berkeley. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Erica. Thank you, Allison. Let's share my screen. Okay, do you see my talk? Yes, we do. Yes, okay, great. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, 
I am uh, excited to hear thoughts and questions from the audience and excited to be able to present on this work. So um, thank you for joining us. So this work started, um, the sort of genesis of this project came from collaboration. Um, and I'd like to start just by acknowledging my collaborators. Um, but we, uh, this uh, collaboration came from um, work with Aaron Beller, the uh, ecology program manager at Google and Rob McDonald at the Nature Conservancy. Um, <clears throat> so we had um, been discussing the um, urban planning goals of increasing urban density within the Bay Area as a strong motivator for action to increase sustainability and reduce vehicle miles traveled. And um, we're recognizing at the same time a clear potential for increases in urban density to comment the expense of nature. We really wanted to dig into this issue further. And so what we did was uh, Rob and I led this work to gather together a panel of experts from around the world that included landscape architects, urban planners, and uh, fo folks with expertise in evaluating ecosystem services and urban biodiversity. Um, this culminated in a workshop of five day long gathering to talk about this issue and ultimately the paper um, Denser and Greener Cities, Green Interventions to Achieve Both Urban Density and Nature in People and Nature um, is the result of this work. So that's what I'll be primarily talking about today. However, at the end, I'd like to dive into thinking about what these results mean for the um, for Santa Clara County in particular, and um, what patterns we found globally are replicated in uh, locally in our landscape. So we know that cities vary enormously in the amount of urban density that they have from our most uh, dense cities of Hong Kong and and uh, New York City to really sprawling suburbs uh, of um, sort of around Phoenix and um, <clears throat> and uh, Tucson and uh, other cities like that in the US. And we also know that the density itself has real implications and trade-offs um, for um, many, many different things related to climate mitigation and adapt adaptation, nature prov provision, biodiversity support. And so um, a really big goal of this work was to understand what in particular is the relationship between urban density and the ability to support nature both within and outside the urban footprint. So we know that urban density has implications for how much nature is available both in the urban core and, and the ability to support nature um, and biodiversity support in the fringes around, uh, around cities. So um, <clears throat> urban um, Densification can be a strategy for protecting land and reducing sprawl outside urban footprints. So thinking just for a moment about what cities, um, what density can do and why it should, uh, can, can be a goal in and of itself to increase urban density. Um, this is the, the figure on the left is from um, some classic work by, by Newman and Kenworthy showing the relationship between urban density and transportation related energy consumption and similar work has subsequently shown similar patterns with vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions that denser cities more compact cities um, allow people to travel less by vehicle and can reduce the footprint associated with that with that travel. In addition to that, denser cities have been shown to be more predict, uh, more productive. So the um, pattern on the right shows the relationship between density and um, and GDP. So this is economic output um, for cities both in the U.S. and uh, outside the U.S. This is for uh, OECD countries specifically. Denser cities have also been shown to be um, areas that are productive and creative, and uh, from an innovation and technology development perspective. They can, as I mentioned, help to reduce, um, to spare land and reduce urban sprawl outside the urban footprint, which has implications for biodiversity support sort of regionally. And uh, increased urban density can also help to create mixed use neighborhoods that are um, uh, more, more walkable. One potential downside of urban density is the potential for an urban psychological health penalty. So this this um, phrase was coined by Rob McDonald and some of his collaborators. Um, looking at the literature there, um, there's a lot of literature showing relationships between urban, uh, between nature and human health. And um, there's the um, 
denser cities do tend to be associated with um, worse mental health outcomes. However, the really big caveat there is that uh, nature may be, um, can be an intentional strategy to reduce that potential negative uh, outcome. Because what we know from all of the, the, the scientific literature that's been done to document the relationship between nature access and um, living close to nature is um, that uh, psychological well-being is a big dimension that living living having nature nearby can um, can help with mental well-being, and so um, again this can be a strategy for reducing the potential for that um, urban uh, psychological health penalty. Providing nature in cities can also be a strategy for su supporting biodiversity itself. So we um, have historically thought of cities as being sort of biological deserts, but increasingly we know that that's not the case, that cities have a lot of biodiversity supported with already within them, and that the more actions we take to, to green our cities, the better off they'll be from a biodiversity support, support perspective. We also know that the biodiversity in cities can help to support regional population sizes for many species and can also support sort of regional conservation goals. So if we know that nature is important in cities, there's a one question is sort of how do you design for it and how do you how do you distribute it? So we can sort of broadly, this is very um, coarse, but we can think about sort of consolidating nature from a biodiversity perspective and interspersing nature from nature from a per people perspective. Now, this is overly simplistic because we know that people benefit from consolidated nature and, uh, and also uh, biodiversity benefits from having interspersed nature throughout the urban fabric as well. Um, so this is overly simplistic, but uh, it is also true that we sort of need, um, need to think about nature uh, distribution in both ways. So we can think about consolidating nature in remnant patches and parks, protecting riparian corridors, backyard gardens, et cetera and interspersing nature through things like green roofs and facades and green um, streets and rights of ways and um, greening around building perimeters as strategies for creating that, that network of nature that's well distributed throughout the, the urban landscape as a strategy for helping to make sure that um, people have uh, close proximity and access to nature in, uh, across as much of the urban footprint as possible. So if we know that, or if we buy that uh, both density and, or, and nature are important things to have in cities, the question is, is it possible to get both of these things? Because we know that as you increase urban density, you also, you, um, by definition, you increase urban, um, sort of the uh, building footprints, the amount of impervious covers tends to go up, the amount of roads tend to increase. And so um, there's a point at which there's a space trade-off where the denser you get, the harder it is to find space to plant trees and to create habitat woven within the urban fabric. And so the question is, if we can, if we know that both of these things are important, how do we provide both? And is it possible to provide both? So one really big thing that we wanted to do with this work was just to document the relationship between density and nature provision, which is not something that has been well explored in the scientific literature before. Um, in order to understand that relationship better, we can, um, uh, if we can understand that relationship better, we can start to think about um, ways to, um, strategies to overcome the potential for trade-offs between density and nature. We know that cities are really variable in density and greenness, but again, that um, sort of re relationship between density and, and greenness has not been well explored in the literature. So we started off by trying to do just that. So um, the figure on the left shows the uh, relationship between tree canopy cover and urban density. This is across the 100 largest urbanized areas uh, in the US. And what you can see is a broadly declining relationship between tree canopy cover and density in um, people per square kilometer at the urbanized area scale. The figure on the right shows a similar um, uh, similar data. So this is, again, for the US, but this is across all 485 urbanized areas. And um, the, um, the points in gray are open space. So this is um, softscape or unsealed cover. And you can see, again, there, this declining relationship where at the, at the highest density, it's um, there is does appear to be a trade-off with unsealed surface cover. The relationship with parks is interesting. So those are the points in green. You can see an increasing relationship 
um, with a sort of hump shape. Um, and what we think this is them showing is that higher density cities do in fact have higher amounts of park as a total proportion of the urbanized area, likely because of a substitution of private for public open uh, green space in the least dense, most sprawly suburban areas. So, um, so uh, really sprawly suburbs with um, uh, large houses and large lots, uh, on large lot sizes, those communities tend to have a lot of green space privately accessible and um, less park uh, access probably as part, in part as a result. So another thing that <clears throat> to notice is that actually going back just for a second to this slide, looking at, if you look at these relationships at the city scale, you notice, yes, there are these declining relationships for two of these three metrics of greenness. However, you also see quite a lot of scatter in the data. Um, when you zoom in to so think not at the at the city scale, but at the neighborhood or block scale, um, you see even more scatter in this relationship. So this, um, these data are taken from the um, 69,000 blocks, census block units in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what you can see, again, is this like broadly declining relationship between tree cover and uh, block level density. However, I, there's a huge amount of scatter in these data. And so one of the things that we wanted to try to do was look at these, um, what we're calling bright spots. So areas that are blocks that are outperforming relative to their density in tree canopy cover or other metrics of greenness in order to try to understand to be an outperformer, what do you need to do and what are the strategies um, that you can take to try to um, create more bright spots on the landscape for a given density, urban density. So zooming in on that um, block group that I was showing in the last slide, this is uh, not a block group, a, a census block unit. So this is a block that outlined in purple in South San Francisco. And if you compare it to the census block that's directly to the left, so just to the north northwest of it, um, you can see it has both higher density and higher tree canopy cover to the census uh, compared to the block just to the left. Um, it is... Uh, a planned multi, um, multi-family, multi-story apartment complex unit. And a couple of things to notice here are that the parking is on the edges. So in the corners are some parking, uh, parking units. There's very little land dedicated to surface parking and uh, no land within this unit dedicated to roads. Um, there's also, you notice the courtyard style of the square buildings with courtyards in between and then trees interspersed throughout uh, across the whole um, block. Comparing that to <clears throat> the block to the left, there, there's, um, those are single family compact, single family residential uh, homes. Um, and one thing that really stands out when you look at this aerial image at this scale is the amount of land taken up by roads is really much higher than in the unit than in the block just to the right. So that um, just uh, exploring these patterns can help us start to, to think about what are the strategies we might use for helping to um, maximize nature within the urban footprint um, for each density that we might wanna look at. So um, taking these patterns and applying them to Santa Clara County, wanted to think about what we can learn from our own landscape. Um, the first thing to note is that the cities in Santa Clara County, so this is not, of course, all of them, but this is some representative examples of cities from Santa Clara County, are not outperformers or underperformers um, relative to the data set as a whole. So um, Palo Alto has high tree canopy cover compared to Mountain View, San Jose, and East Palo Alto, and also much lower density, but in the context of the broader data set across the US is relatively similar. Um, and is showing up as having slightly higher tree canopy cover for its density than you might expect. Mountain View, San Jose, and East Palo Alto are kind of falling right along that line with pretty similar um, tree canopy cover relative to their density from the data set overall. If we zoom in now to think about that neighborhood scale, this is like thinking about um, looking a data set looking at census block groups, so groups of blocks instead of blocks. Um, so there's a thousand fifty five census block groups in the city uh, in the um, in Santa Clara County. This is for residential block groups, so it excludes industrial and commercial areas. 
Um, what you can see just looking at the density patterns is what you might expect, which is um, lower density sort of in the in the foothills of uh, Santa Cruz Mountains and uh, in the Diablo Range and um, higher density areas along transportation corridors and in the core of San Jose. To contextualize those urban densities for our landscape for just a minute, um, those um, areas that have between zero and 500 people per square kilometer along the edges, uh, particularly in the Santa Cruz, uh, along the edge um, in the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, those are what you might most classically kind of consider as sprawl. So those are large houses with very large lots, usually with adjacent open space right next door. Um, between 500 and 1,000 um, people per square kilometer, those are um, single family residential houses with on, on relatively large lots. And at about a thousand, you start to see the lot size decrease. So these are again, still single family residents, but on much smaller lots. Similar for two, between two and 5,000, the lot size is shrinking, but these are still single family homes. Um, between five and 8,000 people per square kilometer is, um, these are single family homes, but in a much more compact style. So much smaller lots often with the houses really close uh, right next to one another. And at 8,000 at above 8,000, these are multifamily apartments mixed with some single family residents and uh, row houses. Again, really much more compact style. <clears throat> so looking specifically at the data from our landscape, you see again, if you're looking at that softscape variable, so that's the amount of unsealed surface as a taken as a percentage of the total block group, the relationship here is again negative, so higher population density is associated with lower total unsealed surface cover, and notably above about 5,000, um, there's very few census block groups that have about, above about 15% um, softscape or unsealed surface cover as a proportion of the block group. The relationship between tree canopy cover and park area is really interesting. So not a declining relationship for either of these, um, for either of these metrics of nature, nature uh, provision. So tree canopy cover um, doesn't appear to, to either increase or decrease. Park area appears to be pretty flat. Um, so in, in a way, this is a sort of good news, what the, one way of interpreting Interpreting this is there's potential for um, nature provision across block groups across a really large range of densities. And even at high densities in our landscape, it appears to still be possible to be a bright spot. So the question is, how can we make more of our block groups into bright spots if they're currently dark spots? So looking for, um, at a couple of examples of bright and dark spots, I'm going to uh, show two two bright spots and one dark spot of very similar population density. So all three of these are about between eight and 9,000 pe um, people per square kilometer. So this first bright spot is from Mountain View. This is um, Rangstorf Park right in the center. And um, some things to note that are associated with making this place a bright spot is of course the open space. So having open space within a block group is really good strategy for having more nature access. Um, then other things that stand out is, uh, of course, these are multifamily units. That's how we sort of get to that really high population density. Um, uh, Multi-story, so these are just two-story apartment complexes. And then the other thing that stands out is relatively little space for roads and limited surface parking. Um, this bright spot is in uh, San Jose. So this is, again, similar population density, tree canopy cover of 23%. So outperforming relative to that density. And uh, things that stand out here is the large old trees between planted all over the place between the buildings and also in the parking lot at the south. Um, again, these are multifamily housing. The That pattern of the, the square building with the central courtyard is a feature right in the middle. And again, limited surface parking and road, um, road area. Compare that to this dark spot of really similar population density. This is from, um, Eastern San Jose, um, tree canopy cover, similar population density, but tree canopy cover of only 6%. Um, what you really, so this is single family, detached single family residences. And what you really notice looking at this is that there's just very few trees in the yards or along the street rights of way. Um, and then also that there's a relatively much larger proportion of the area de dedicated to roads. So uh, impervious cover is a larger fraction of the total block group area. 
<clears throat> so a few questions we might ask ourselves sort of in conclusion, what does this, in, in thinking about what does this all mean is um, the first question we could ask is, well, okay, what, so what density should we be designing for? Um, and if we think about that question um, from the global data sets I was showing earlier and also the scientific literature more broadly, um, there is evidence that human health, um, from a human health perspective, uh, denser areas are associated with re reduced obesity and uh, rates of um, and uh, reduced rates of obesity and body mass index, and um, that starts to happen in about a thousand people per square kilometer. Um, from biodiversity perspective, cities with at least a thousand per people per square kilometer have associated with reduced sprawl on the fringes, and that vehicle miles traveled and car use, transportation, energy use. Um, pattern I was showing earlier sets in at about one to 3,000 people per square kilometer. At the higher end, we start to see those negative impacts on the ability to provision nature at 10 to 50,000 um, people per square kilometer, both in the provision of green space and the amount of tree canopy cover. What we can say from our landscape is that most of Santa Clara County falls within that range of one to 10,000. And so this is maybe good news from the perspective of thinking about design, because I, one implication is that well, we can we can get these benefits already, even at some of the um, across most of the landscape, we have the density we need already to achieve most of these benefits that we've been talking about. Um, doesn't mean it shouldn't be a goal to, to continue to promote infill as a potential strategy. Um, however, another thing that we can do is think about how do we um, make sure we provision nature across the landscape, across that range of densities in as many places as possible and bump those dark spots, uh, dark spots and turn them into bright spots. So strategies that came out of this work that we might use and implications for design is that limiting surface parking seems to be, comes out as a huge theme. So the bright, I didn't show a lot of dark spots, but many dark spots have huge amounts of surface parking in them. Um, you can think about putting parking, parking at the edges of um, multifamily unit com apartment complexes or where possible underground or in uh, parking garages or just reducing amount of parking overall. Um, courtyards and spaces between buildings are great opportunities to provide space for trees and also other amenities. Um, multifamily apartments have interesting implications for the amount of road area that it, a unit need, that, that an area needs to provide. Uh, and that's a really um, strong theme that comes out as well. And then other kind of greening strategies like planting trees between buildings along rights of way, greening vacant lots, protecting and planting large trees, um, protecting repairing corridors and green abandoned rail corridors are all really great strategies for um, for, for uh, increasing nature uh, across a range of densities. And I'd like to wrap up just by um, um, noting an NPR article I heard recently that was um, noting the, the, um, that many cities are ditching their policies to um, require that any developer provide um, on-street parking minimum requirements. So this is a really great policy change that could really free up more space, um, less land dedicated to surface parking can really um, free up space for nature. And with that, I'll conclude. Um, please contact me as my email address at the bottom if you're interested to talk more and uh, happy to hear thoughts and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spotswood, um, and thank you to all of our participants who have been sharing really thoughtful questions um, in the Q&A. I encourage you to keep them coming. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Paul Kephart. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen briefly. Um, Paul is the founder, principal, ecologist, and designer, uh, ASLA uh, from RANA. Um, Paul is recognized as a horticultural and botanical expert in the flora of coastal North America. He has a profound understanding of natural systems and is an industry leader in ecological and landscape design. Paul has a keen ability to see the geologic, natural, and cultural history embodied in a landscape and simultaneously imagine its most vibrant future. For 30 years, Paul has given himself to observation, scientific understanding and intimate relationship with the great diversity of natural systems. It is Paul's deepest joy to design landscapes that integrate site-specific indigenous plants into both restored wildlands and into the built environment. 
As principal ecologist and designer at RANA, Paul is sought after as a pioneer and innovator of living architectural systems, a thought leader in ecological design, and a dedicated horticulturist. Paul has consulted on many groundbreaking and iconic projects and the cumulative restoration of many thousands of acres of grassland, wetland, and coastal landscapes in the Western US. We're so glad to have you, Paul. I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really uh, pleased to be here today. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, presentation by Erica is a good context for what I would like to present, and that is some of the uh, initiatives and interventions that we can take from a design perspective, and that is uh, green infrastructure, which is focused in this case on water and stormwater infrastructure, bioswales or rain gardens. I'd like to talk about living architecture and some and show examples of uh, large scale living architecture, green walls and, and uh, living roofs. Uh, ecological restoration, which is uh, really how I got started in this work and that I'm an ecologist a restoration ecologist, and I apply these principles of restoration ecology to the built environment. And then also biophilic design and that relationship to human health and well-being around these greening uh, initiatives. Uh, we start with these overarching design elements, and from a holistic standpoint, we look at as many of these elements as possible, uh, water, waste, energy, biodiversity, human health and well-being, soil and food. And, and when we integrate these, we find that these landscapes become more productive and our resources are optimized. And uh, to uh, really follow along the lines of Dr. Spotswood's presentation, the understanding of what is existing, those resources around permeability, uh, green spaces, parks, uh, schools, open space, corridors, and then mountain views infrastructure in regard to uh, the green infrastructure that's existing, that'll lead us to understand where are those gaps and where are those areas that we can apply these green measures to get the most from the higher density and greening of the city. Mountain View covers about 12 square miles. There's thousands of acres of park and wildlife area with a 750 acre wildlife and recreation area at shoreline. Uh, Stevens Creek is a, is a riparian corridor that connects that gradient from the shoreline to the mountains. And uh, 34 park school, 10 schools, five sports centers and fields and these Greenways and parks shown here on the red stars indicate, uh, I guess somebody once asked me, well, what are these, what good are these green buildings or these green measures around restoring biodiversity or canopy cover? And the answer is they're only as good as what they're connected to. So really getting a great understanding of what we have, the, the nature areas, for example, the marshes and grasslands and biodiversity at shoreline. And then what we also face in terms of barriers, uh, roads and highways, and where those opportunities exist to uh, provide this green infrastructure and, and living architecture. And the areas that we want to target are really locked between that waterway and the coastal range and the in these and in this the, the this uh, survey really indicates where we have really high levels of uh, impervious areas, uh, high levels of urban density without greening. And then what we want to think about is how we connect these from that the ocean to the mountains. And uh, I was really quite surprised and pleased when we did an initial understanding of the terrestrial biodiversity. And 
compared to other urban areas throughout the state in terms of biodiversity, we have something to work with. We rank anywhere from average to high in terms of terrestrial biodiversity of plant, animal, amphibian, and avian, and insects. And in terms of rare species richness, even the same, we have a, a high level within the city boundary of species richness. And those gray and green uh, uh, colors there indicate where those are the highest and medium species richness of rare species. And then we can prioritize by uh, opportunity where there's very high density uh, uh, how does that facilitate our future planning and and taking that uh, overlays of species richness and and uh, biological diversity and greening and then looking where there are areas that are low and there are areas where there's barren land. The uh, rare species examples that we have to work with and to and to protect and and celebrate or a number of plants and birds and amphibians. Uh, the main land use of developed lands, I guess the question here is how can we take these uh, ecological habitats, these systems, if you will, of grasslands, riparian and oak savanna, and use these as analogs to where we can simulate or replicate the plant cover some of the processes and functions and really integrate that right into the urban fabric and make those a part of structure and part of the community. Some of these as green streets initiatives uh, as good examples include creating bioswales and rain gardens to, to uh, attenuate stormwater, cool that water on the way to its receiving waters, provide habitat and pollinating gardens, thermally modify those hot streets uh, and take care of some of these heat island effect issues and create a really pleasant environment for people and birds as well. And then green walls and living roofs that actually can lower the energy demands, the reflectivity and the albedo of these buildings can also cool the the city and, and enhance its productivity and optimize the resources used. Some examples of those include Green Street infrastructure, as I mentioned, stormwater gardens and, and these stormwater conveyances uh, on the uh, uh, architectural uh, side of these uh, initiatives, these Green walls and uh, living walls can thermally protect the building, provide habitat, and just make this really comfortable, joyous place to be. The street trees and that canopy, you know, modify the, the temperatures and uh, create that nice understory that people really enjoy. In terms of these highways that we see often as barriers to biological diversity and connectivity, um, they do provide opportunity for small insects and pollinators and some birds, but we do have to be cautious about what types of vegetation that we uh, create there and that it can be a biological trap or an ecological trap for large mammals and others. Uh, just because of the safety issues in the highway. There are solutions out there. I'm involved in two major uh, crossings, wildlife crossings on these highways within the state of California that look for mammal crossings and, and to encourage the crossing and corridor connectivity from one green space to another. And these are also on the deck of these crossings, great opportunities for walking trail connectivity or parks. Now I'll show you some examples of the work that I've been involved with, um, some of these uh, dating back about the last five to 10 years. And the Transbay Terminal Park, that was uh, my original concept design with uh, Cesar Pelli's office and where we looked at how to create the second largest park in, in a very highly dense area in downtown San Francisco, 
worked with Peter Walker, among others, on the design of this. And our emphasis here was around water and waste and that we could take the wastewater of the laboratories and 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 use that and the and the uh, water from the landscape and re and clean it and recycle it and use it by creating these uh, wonderful rainwater and uh, gray water gardens that used that water as a part of the landscape, and it diverted that water from the sanitary sewers and actually lowered the potable water demand for the building. It's a great project. When I first started that concept, we did not have in the PUC any of the rules, regulations, or safety measures in order to implement gray water on structure. And, and what came out of that now in the city, there's actually grants for urban buildings and architecture to include these kinds of systems into their planning process. Another large scale project, project uh, you know, right at the, the, the center and the, the shoreline of the Vancouver, which is a, simply a very high dense city of concrete, steel and glass was the Vancouver Convention Center. We looked at biological diversity as one of our goals, but again, 24,000 person capacity with the uh, largest single span convention center exhibit area in North America and a huge energy demand. And we basically took all the gray water, put it in biodigesters in the basement, and then put that water and filter it through this living system. And what came out of this at the time, we did not have it as part of our objectives, but that uh, the trans evaporation and the thermal protection of the soil and plants really enhanced the took the spikes and the and the uh, the valleys out of the energy demand so it, it created more of a stable interior temperature for heating and cooling and we also saw savings from the energy demand to to, to uh, condition the building and this is an example of how these systems are stacked functions and if you look at permaculture design, we're looking at multiple or multi-trophic systems that really enhance all of the resource optimized. It also became a great opportunity for design and many of the uh, structures, the towers in Vancouver looked down on this uh, and, it, and instead of a, a big flat bare or white roof, this became a, a really iconic landmark. There's bees and tours, and, and this is really a beautiful space. Uh, these green roofs that we mentioned also uh, support biological diversity. And the, the uh, iconic project I was able to work with uh, Renzo Piano on uh, and I was just visited, there's 107 vascular plants on the roof, 87% uh, uh, percent increase of, of uh, insects and pollinators over what's found in the park on the ground plane. It also has become an area of, of education and interpretation of uh, urban ecology and sustainable design. Uh, just a really wonderful project in terms of in how to enhance biological diversity in the urban uh, center. This project is uh, about stormwater actually and how to social socially activate these green spaces in a high density area. And the areas of green here that become these planters there are just enough green and soil to moderate the stormwater runoff in order to get within the city's guidelines for stormwater runoff and retention. But it also, when I looked at this in retrospect, you know, from a social distancing or a socialization standpoint and how to find a place in the busy workplace above the city streets, it provides this little park opportunity for people to get away, to study, to do emails, to visit and gather. On the vertical aspect of these initiatives, uh, this is uh, uh, in Sunset Boulevard, very high profile, high risk project. It's, it's, I'm showing you all these projects that are at least 10 years old to demonstrate their, 
they're all still in good shape. They've lasted, they've been sustainable, and they have performed as the way in which we designed and built those objectives and metrics. This is on the uh, IAC building. Uh, many, many species of pollinating plants for butterflies and birds, and it's such a joy in the you know heart of Sunset Boulevard, then these are the species of butterflies, common butterflies the, that we can see and, and hummingbird nesting in the living walls. One really important aspect of this project was that I, when I first started it, I discovered a spring that was uh, maybe most, uh, maybe some nuisance water, but also a, a, a spring that daylighted in the cracks of the concrete in the parking structure under the building. And so we were able to harvest that. It turned out that that's some of the really clean water and, and the right pH. And so we commingled storm water and that uh, spring water, put that in tanks in a couple of parking structures. So this project, you know, often our criticism is these projects take a lot of water. But this project has been going on for over 10 years without the use of potable water. And then here locally, and we've got a lot of these kind of commercial projects and this one in, on Main Street in Redwood City where we've done flow through planters for stormwater trees that establish that kind of canopy. And moreover, these gardens that are really habitat gardens, that salvia spathaceae really, and the penstemons, you know, they attract these uh, butterflies and birds. In terms of bio, uh, biophilic design, uh, this project, the Cathedral Hill uh, Hospital, was really how, you know, when, when we look at biophilia, the um, uh, Keller studies indicate that, uh, you know, your, your, uh, recovery times are decreased, your uh, cognitive function increases, memory increases, productivity studies in the, in the uh, uh, commercial and, and corporate world have indicated that people are happier and, and, uh, and more content when they have vegetation and nature uh, in their lives. And so we Im included that in all of the views from the hospital rooms that uh, in the hospital with these wonderful uh, diverse gardens that supported a many different species of, of plants and wildlife that became also this is a garden for staff and hospitals are sometimes areas of trauma and um, and oftentimes areas of joy where people are healed or people are not. And we wanted to create a place for staff to where they could get out above the city streets in these high dense areas and really enjoy a, 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 a part of nature and enjoy the calming effect and the beauty. Now, in terms of resiliency, this is a big topic and, and, and it's a, uh, one that we're starting to address in the design world. And, and, the, and if you think about the rise in sea level is projected at 3.2 feet over the next 25 years or so, and the king tides and the kind of uh, initiatives that one would undertake. And we partnered with GGN uh, uh, out of Seattle, great folks in this park and South San Francisco. And, and one of the strategies that I put forth around resilience was not necessarily to put up a, a, a living barrier or, or a riprap or these kinds of intrusive initiatives, but rather to really peel back the coastline, soften the coastline, and create more mudflat ecology that is now grassland. And over time, so this is like a retreat, and it's it's more about working with nature than trying to de to uh, uh, combat nature or hold nature's natural processes back. And it became a really interesting study in how we grade the site. So over a fifty year time frame, uh, nature can naturally go from you know flooded areas that are part of the the brackish water to mudflat ecology to grassland 
and naturally just adapt. So these are resilient landscapes that are naturally adaptive. They're site adaptive and climate adaptive landscapes with all the types of plants that will move up that gradient over time. That's what I have for today. I'm really pleased to be a part of this and I'm hoping that uh, these kinds of initiatives can take place in Mountain View. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, our next speaker today is going to be Allison Hicks. Uh, Allison Hicks is a city council member from the city of Mountain View. Um, Allison was first elected to the Mountain View City Council in 2019 and served as mayor in 2023. Among other duties, she chairs the Council Sustainability Committee. Before election to the city council, she was a city planner and community activist. Allison worked on the city of Oakland's downtown entertainment district under Mayor Jerry Brown. She was the associate director of the nonprofit Northern California Land Trust. She worked in current planning for the city of San Jose, and she did development work for the nonprofit Living Classroom. Allison has a master of city and regional planning from UC Berkeley. And Allison, I will get the slide started and let you take Well, thank you, Allison, and thank you also to Erica and Paul. I think I didn't know you would focus so much on Mountain View, and I think you really gave good background for what I'll be talking about, which is where the rubber meets the road. How do we work with developers and neighbors and make this happen um, in real life? Um, so I love the topic denser and greener, um, and here are some ways that Mountain View was adding green spaces to our city. We Just a little background, Mountain View has about 80,000 residents. We're home to Google's headquarters and other tech offices. And what you're seeing right now is our main street, Castro Street. In Mountain View, we strive to build housing to match our job base so that housing will become more affordable. And we have a new award-winning housing element plan to add the housing we need. The plan, that plan outlines how we'll add actually 11,000 units of housing to our city over the next eight years. So the topic denser and greener is really appropriate for us. Next slide. So I want to start by summarizing why I think it's crucial to add trees and green spaces as we densify. Um, as written in the article, Denser and Greener, urban growth is occurring faster than has ever been experienced in human history. I most like to refer to statistics from the Forest Service that cities in the US covered two and a half uh, of the US land area in 1990, so a while ago, but are projected to reach over 8% by 2050. So if you've done the math, that's uh, more than tripling the amount of uh, land covered by urban development. Another way of picturing it is that this is an area greater than the states of Montana, Vermont, and New Hampshire. So clearly, how we use city land is an extremely important part of how we address our environmental problems. And by the way, this is one of my favorite photos in this presentation. It shows transit-oriented development next to the South San Francisco BART station, but it, I think it could be many barrier area transit-oriented developments, and I think we can do much better. Um, as you look at, at some examples of doing better, I want you to think back to this slide and compare. Next slide. So this is my neighborhood, by the way. I'm sure most people in this audience know that there are a lot of environmental and health reasons we might uh, want to make room for trees and other green space in our city, and, I, and other speakers have mentioned them. So I'm not going to give you a complete list, but just a reminder, they include uh, reducing heat, preventing flooding in cities, buffering pedestrians and bikers from cars and exhaust, enabling biodiversity and sequestering carbon. 
uh, parks and tree-lined streets allow and encourage active transportation and physical activity in general. They uh, reduce mental health problems like depression and anxiety, and they get us off our devices and outside to meet our neighbors. Um, next slide. But if those reasons uh, that I mentioned aren't good enough reasons for you, I have some additional reasons. As we grow, we have to create places that people choose to live in. Census data tells us that between 2010 and 2020, the share of Americans choosing to live in sprawling suburbs grew by over 10%, and the pandemic accelerated this trend. Young adults have often been touted in the press as urban advocates, happy to live in flats, bikes, and use mass transit and so forth. But actually, uh, young adults are moving further and further out into the open spaces we need to protect. So we need, I think, not just to build cities, but to build livable cities. Next slide. So in this talk, I'm gonna describe six ways that Mountain View is greening our city while building more densely. Having been on the council for the past five years, I'll tell you greening while densifying is really hard. But these are the opportunities I see and they give me hope that we can attract people to urban living. The first avenue I'll be talking about is precise plans, strategic plans and general redevelopment. Next slide. A, pre a precise plan is a plan for a defined area within a city created with community and other stakeholder input. Precise plans are often focused on redevelopment areas or other areas that might call for transformational change. On the peninsula, you can see them in areas with maybe outdated malls and other shopping areas, um, or like Mountain View's North Bayshore Master Plan, in one-story office parks with acres of surface parking. The North Bayshore Master Plan is groundbreaking because a number of environmental nonprofits, including Audubon, the Sierra Club, Green Foothills, and a lot more, after a lot of dialogue, persuaded Google's real estate team to partner with them and create a plan that will restore habitat while adding housing and complete communities walking distance from jobs. Next slide. This plan pulls development away from wetlands, riparian areas, and the bay. It tears down one-story offices and replaces them with multi-story offices, homes, shopping, and other things we need for a complete community. It'll use native plants like milkweed and flowers that support monarch butterflies and corridors of habitat for pollinating insects and migratory and local birds. The process has influenced other Google developments in the area, and hopefully urban ecological developments can become the new normal. Next slide. A second avenue for urban greening is on, uh, I think what Erica has been talking about in her article is remnant open space. This would be like Mountain Dew's Shoreline Park on the city's northernmost border of the bay. Uh, this area was uh, decades ago best known as a pig farm and infill dump. It's become a 750 acre multi-purpose recreational space and critical wildlife refuge, especially for migratory birds. Council adopted our shoreline wildlife management plan in 2021 uh, to accomplish one of our highest priorities, which is increasing and maintaining biodiversity in the city and particularly in the shoreline area. Next slide. So this plan describes state and federal regulations and policies that the city will work with to protect native and special status wildlife species. Um, it identifies opportunities and constraints regarding management and enhancement of wildlife and habitats. Next slide. So I'm hoping this plan will also be a model for around the bay. Our third avenue for urban greening is biodiversity strategies. 
this uh, particular goal of Mountain View was inspired by our ecological partnerships in North Bay Shore. Mountain View is on its way to being one of the first cities in the country with a specific biodiversity strategy. Um, you may know that the UN declared that our dangerous decline in nature, or often referred to as species extinction, is one of the world's top environmental problems with dangers as serious as global warming. In fact, in 2022, the UN held COP15, which is like the recent uh, climate change focus COP28 that you may have, you probably read about, except COP15 was focused on measures to fight species extinction and increase biodiversity, including steps we can take in our cities. In Mountain View, our biodiversity strategy will include measures to allow people in nature, including mammals, pollinators, birds, and native plants to thrive together. Next slide. So trees are one of the most important components of urban biodiversity. According to the UN, trees supply 28% of the world's oxygen. And of course, they also clean our air, sequester carbon, provide habitat, and cool our city. So we need to protect and grow them. In Mountain View, we're developing a new urban forest plan to update the city's old plan. This, by the way, is the Atlassian and Coursera corporate campus on Evelyn Avenue in Mountain View. And I think it's a great example of denser and greener office parks. And I hope they're the wave of the future. Next slide. The idea of our biodiversity plan is to transform everything we develop piece by piece, basically erasing the concrete jungle and rewilding wherever we can. This is a life science park by the landscape architect Carducci Associates. I wanna mention Mountain View is also planning to do a dark skies ordinance. Here we can follow Cupertino's model. What we've found is that particularly since LED lighting has made installation of lighting much cheaper, um, lighting has proliferated to the point that it actually damages and even kills certain plants and animals. And 24 seven lighting is not good for people either. So offices like the one in this photo should dim or turn off their lights at night. Next slide. So rewilding everything we develop piece by piece, of course, also includes housing development. These are plans for our Montecito affordable apartments by the developer Charities Housing and Studio E Architects, which will break ground on February 22nd. Now, I can't say we used our biodiversity plan to tell them how to green their development as these plans preceded our biodiversity plan, but I think they're a great example of what one can do on a tighter site a denser site and uh, note they include more street trees to buffer pedestrians from the street, native and dry plants instead of long grass and berms, riparian bioretention areas, and shade gardens for residents with ample trees. Next slide. I was particularly impressed with their natural play area plans. Um, because this is the kind of place I'd want to spend time with my family with rocks and trees and natural landscaping right outside my front door. Next slide. So we hope that our biodiversity plan will transform market rate housing and mixed use areas as well. The Bay Meadows neighborhood in San Mateo that replaced the Bay Meadows racetrack and pictured here might be an example of a development moving us towards biodiversity with native dry landscaping, community gardens, bike lanes, natural playgrounds um, where children can climb and play on rocks and tree stumps. Altogether, it's an 83-acre mixed-use, transit-oriented, specific plan development, which when complete will have over 1,200 housing units, which will be mostly townhomes and apartments. 
Next slide. So the fourth avenue I'll mention for urban greening is schoolyards. In the left and bottom photo, we see students attending outdoor classes conducted by the group Living Craft Classroom at our Mountain View Public Schools in the Mountain View Wisdom School District. And on the top right, we say we see uh, Backitch Elementary School in Marin County. Schoolyards make up a large amount of the open space in many cities. In Mountain View, we have well over 100 acres of schoolyards. And public schoolyards often double as public park space after school hours. And of course, our children spend a lot of their outdoor time in schoolyards. So schoolyards are very important places. Next slide. At the same time, public schools are not given a lot of funding for landscaping. Landscaping, of course, is not their core mission. As a result, lots of schoolyards are covered with concrete and blacktop and lots of lawn and juniper bushes, all easy maintenance, but leaving a good portion of schoolyard acreage fairly useless for children and also useless as habitat. Mountain View's elementary and middle school district, the Mountain View Wisman School District, has started working with the landscaping firm Carducci on an excellent project to green campuses. Carducci has worked in other cities to break up hardscaping and on other schoolyards to break up hardscaping with natural landscaping, as you can see in the top left photo. Next slide. The nonprofit The Living Classroom creates native gardens, planted beds, and planter boxes, and then teaches outdoor classes from those spaces. And of course, canopy plants trees in our schoolyards. I also hope uh, this can be a model for other school districts, but it requires a lot of public advocacy as there's a lot of pressure on schools to keep kids indoors studying and defense in school yard, yards and not a lot of money to do things differently. Next slide. The fifth avenue for urban greening is parks. Mountain View is in the midst of creating a new parks and rec strategic plan um, that includes neighborhood parks, open space, trail systems, recreation facilities, and programs. Uh, the, in the picture, we see Pioneer Park adjacent to our library. Now, there are two key things residents bring up most often when we talk about updating the plan. The first is that we need more parks, particularly in underserved neighborhoods as we densify. Next slide. So the second thing people bring up is that we need to add more shade trees and other natural elements to our parks um, rather than blacktop and rubberized surface in part because parks just should be attractive and trees make them that way, but also in part because as our planet warms, we need shade trees and other green elements so that our parks are cool enough to use in the summer. Um, although urban parks like Golden Gate and Central Park have long had trees and even wooded areas, suburban parks often lack them and can be barren and underused in summer days. Next slide. My, si oh, my sixth and last avenue for urban greening is streetscapes. Streetscapes are those stretches of land often between buildings that include sidewalks, planting strips, bike lanes, and streets. Believe it or not, city-owned streetscapes make up about 30% of the acreage of most cities. That's a huge amount of land and we own it, it's public property. So we can do much better things with it than we're doing now. Next slide. So perhaps most obviously, our streetscapes can be used to create tree and landscape corridors. Green corridors, uh, like these provide the connectivity needed for pollinators and other creatures to move from place to place and thrive. 
And this is a rendering of a proposed green street in Mountain View's North Bayshore area. Um, when greening streets, I hope we can pay particular attention to areas of our cities that are underserved with green space, um, narrowing roads where possible and essentially creating linear parks for walking to errands, jogging, dog walking, and more. Um, because people, not just, um, not just animals, need connectivity and green art corridors to thrive. Next slide. So there's much more we can do with our streetscapes. The climate crisis and the pandemic have ushered in a worldwide movement to turn streets into public places where people can socialize outdoors, use active transportation, and generally enjoy greener cities. I'm a big advocate for rethinking streets and streetscapes so they meet our environmental health and equity goals. Here we see once auto-oriented streets turned into pedestrian malls and slow and shared streets where pedestrians and bikers have priority over cars. Also on the bottom right, we see a smart road diet in a neighborhood where people both wanted more street trees and wanted some on-street parking. They've created bulb outs periodically along the street to make room for both cars and trees. Next slide. Green streetscapes can also be used to calm traffic. On the left, you see a street that was turned into a one-way street to allow a bike lane protected with ample planting strips. And on the right, you see a mini traffic circle that slows cars down as they enter a neighborhood street. Green streets can naturally slow traffic. I personally think they make a neighborhood more pleasant than speed humps and flashing signs and would like to encourage them. Next slide. As I mentioned, the climate crisis and the pandemic have ushered in a worldwide movement to turn streets and the urban outdoors in general into places where people can spend time outside, use active transportation, and enjoy greener cities. European cities seem to be the epicenter of this movement with multiple streets becoming car-free and even reforested. But many places in the US, including Silicon Valley, are starting down this road as well. And I'm hoping this webinar gives everybody the information and motivation they need to advocate for denser and greener cities that we all want to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you to all of our panelists for the practical, informative, and inspiring talks. Um, we are going to transition now to our question and answer, so I invite our panelists to come back on camera if you're able to. And my colleague, Micah, is going to share some of the questions that um, all of the attendees uh, have uh, input throughout the session. Um, and uh, direct them to the relevant speaker or speakers. Micah, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Allie, and thank you all of our panelists for wonderful presentations and to all of our attendees for really thoughtful, interesting questions. Um, we've been sort of sorting uh, through them behind the scenes and we'll highlight a few today. And then as Ali shared, we'll um, answer any we don't get to offline. So the first one, um, is for you, Erica, this is back to your presentation where you talked a lot about tree canopy cover. And Savannah has asked, um, how was tree canopy measured? Yeah, it's measured from remotely sensed data. Um, so that's aerial imagery to, from, it's actually from a variety of sources. So the data set from across the US was um, measured from, different remotely sensed data than the data set from Santa Clara County. Um, the data from uh, from across the US, the 100 largest urbanized areas was measured um, from earlier data sets. I believe the data set was from 2010. 
and uh, 30 meter resolution data from the national land cover data set. Um, the data from um, Santa Clara County was taken from, um, is from, is created by a company called Earth Define for the US Forest Service and is publicly available in 2018 is the year on that. Um, and so what they usually do is they take imagery and then they use image classification algorithms to, ad to identify the trees from pictures of sa either satellite or um, plane flight imagery uh, of the urban landscape. Great. Thanks, Erica. And there's some really cool tools out there now for people to sort of explore canopy coverage in different areas on their own. So we can include some of those in the follow up resources as well. Um, a related question about tree canopy cover, um, Amy Beth had asked, how does tree canopy compare between areas that are lower, middle and high income? And I think that can be for any of the panelists if you have comments on that. Yeah, I can I can give um, the locally specific and the broader answer. Uh, I was actually going to put the I can put resources in there, but we did an analysis of San Jose in particular, looking at that question using census data and tree canopy cover data, um, and uh, and also park access data. And we found for both parks and trees, um, higher income neighborhoods have higher um, higher tree canopy cover. That pattern is also parsed by race in interesting ways. I'll share the report that that came from um, in the chat. Uh, and then we've also looked at that data, that, that question um, across the whole U US, across those 485 um, uh, uh, urbanized areas and found that pattern of difference in race by race and income is persistent across the whole US um, across census block groups um, in, across cities almost everywhere. Uh, and that was published in a paper in Nature Sustainability that also looked re at relationships at patterns by income of rate and race of exposure and um, uh, uh, getting sick with COVID. So that was published in 2020 and I can include the results of that. So this pattern of income differences in park access and tree canopy cover uh, is really persistent and really, um, there's also evidence of it that comes from outside the U.S. as well. Yeah, really and I would just add that that's reflected, you know, in Mountain View as well. Yeah, and we can share some, um, in addition to the resources, it sounds like Erica has quite a few. Um, Canopy does a lot of work on tree cover equity locally and, and solutions for sort of bridging that gap. So we can share some background articles too about, um, you know, how some of those disparities came about. Um, let's see, there's a couple questions here about biodiversity. I think this also goes back to your presentation, Erica, but anyone's welcome to ask. Um, can you give sort of a brief description of how you assess biodiversity? What are the tools you use to sort of measure that? And actually this goes to Paul's, Paul's presentation. Um, what are the tools you use to assess biodiversity and Paul, you had shared that the um, biodiversity in Mountain View includes both native and invasive species. Can you elaborate a, a little bit around that and the you know, um, when, sort of when, methodology? Uh, there are some references that are in the presentation that people can look at, but for, primarily in this study, we looked at the natural diversity database for rare species uh, presence uh, throughout the area. Uh, and, uh, that was our primary reference there. Anything, um, Erica, that you would want to add? Yeah, sure. To the broader question of how how you measure biodiversity, it really depends on the project in question and scale. So it's hard to give a single one single answer, but I can give some like general things. Um, if you have no biodiversity data whatsoever, so nobody's like looked and measured in, in a city, um, the best thing you can do is to use um, vegetation and tree data actually as the proxy because biodiversity yeah. is strongly associated with both of those things. So if you know you have more, so places with more trees and and, and um, more NDVI is a measure, is a remotely sensed measure of the total volume of vegetation can give you a proxy. So I'm going to tell you everything, of course. Um, then the second thing I'll say is that um, 
the largest and best biodiversity data set for urban areas in the world right now comes from community science. So the two main platforms mm -hmm. for community science data are iNaturalist and eBird. So eBird is birds only and iNaturalist is everything. Um, those have become incredibly valuable resources of biodiversity data for cities across the world. Um, and then of course, if you have field data, that's the best, the, that's the best. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple questions in here about the Miyawaki tiny pocket forest concept um, that you know we've been hearing about. And I think the Berkeley Unified School District did something recently with this. Um, do any of you have comments or thoughts? Um, well, it, could one of you perhaps explain for those who aren't familiar what the Miyawaki forest method is? And if you have any comments or thoughts about that method of sort of higher density planting installation. Well, while somebody's, I am not the person to describe it, how, technically how you grow a Milwaukee forest, but I should say that um, some of our resident groups in Mountain View, uh, such as Green Spaces, uh, which is a local resident group that advocates for green spaces in our city, um, have advocated for things along those lines. And, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of, as we do our biodiversity planning and our parks and rec plan, I hope that one of the biggest things we do is to look for opportunities to plant more trees, um, you know, possibly densely in different spaces like right of ways near, um, you know, near larger streets and um, underused pockets of or spaces in either parks, schoolyards, uh, housing developments, you know, wherever might be appropriate. Great, thanks, Allison. Any other thoughts or comments on that? And we can provide a few links in the follow-up resources too to what those um, Milwaukee forests are. Um, I don't know how, we'll probably have time for one or two more questions. And I think this one's interesting around um green roofs and walls so um someone shares as a landscape architect i've been hearing about green roofs and walls for many years but have seen few examples that are successful over the long term uh have the issues around maintenance practices and costs been resolved somewhat over the years and they share a follow-up just around the the challenges of sort of maintenance and are there um best practices or strategies particularly for public agencies to sort of address the challenges of maintenance for you know many of these projects, in particular green woofs and walls, but perhaps more broadly as well. Yeah, I can certainly address that, having designed and built probably more acreage of living roofs in North America. Uh, I think the answer really revolves around uh, appropriate plant selection. Uh, what we see in the industry today are uh, generic plant uh, specifications that aren't site adapted or climate adapted. Also, the uh, living roof industry and the landscape architecture industry uh, trend towards generalized specifications that aren't uh, specific to a certain area, a certain substrate. Uh, we look at it from an ecological approach where aspect and orientation, um, shading, when we did the Transbay Terminal that became, a, a, with the towers that were built, that be, the climate was changed. And so all these uh, indicators are, of the environmental study lead us to the proper plant selection, soil uh, development, uh, irrigation strategies, and, and that leads to the maintenance regimes. And when these projects fail, it's often because the plant cover isn't resilient. It, there's not enough diversity. There are not enough uh, rhizomaceous plants that can hold the soils together. Oftentimes we see them in when they're uh, adjacent to rural areas become uh, invaded with uh, uh, more weedy species and it enhance, increases the maintenance requirements. People get frustrated and and that tips a balance towards that weedy species. 
in uh, most of the large scale projects I showed are over 10 years old and and uh, the maintenance has gone down over time rather than up. Uh, but the, again, the, the industry and, and, uh, and the design industry, uh, we need to do, we need to understand why these projects fail and they, they, they do fail for a number of reasons. Uh, but there's ways in which at the front end and the design end that we can make sure that they are successful over the long term. And then uh, in terms of that economic equation, because that's often in people's mind, uh, you know, you have to look at <clears throat> what are the <clears throat> resources we can optimize if we can divert uh, stormwater from the stormwater attenuation that happens. That has an economic value. <clears throat> if we can lower energy costs, and the studies are out there to indicate how energy uh, costs are reduced, then that's another uh, uh, <clears throat> a metric for how these roofs can, you know, pay or offset those long-term ma maintenance costs. But moreover, what we've found is they become these green initiatives, the living walls or roofs, really become an in economic in engine, and that we've seen this in in studies where areas that where people have these kinds of features those areas become uh, activated, they become areas of commerce and interest. So there's many ways to address that, um, the, the economic as well as the long-term maintenance. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think, Ali, we are probably out of time for questions, but thank you everyone for your really thoughtful questions and we will follow up um, with some more detail and some answers to questions we didn't get to in the follow-up resources. So I'll um, thank you, panelists, and uh, I'll pass it back to Ali for wrapping us up. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, panelists. Um, I just want to share a few reminders as we bring our time together to a close. Um, first, we will provide the presentation slides and resources um, soon, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email. We'll also post the answers, as Micah mentioned, to the unanswered questions on Canopy's webinar page as soon as we can. Um, if you enjoyed the webinar, um, please check out our website to view more webinars like this one. Uh, we have recordings of past webinars um, on uh, related topics. Um, and then this is something that we hope to also do more of in the future. Thank you all for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.